Mrs. Lake is in the garden when I get home. She tries to grow vegetables. It's one of those things adults do, pretend to be farmers. It's like you spend half your life trying to learn to be a grown-up and how to do stuff like taxes and give oral presentations on cumulonimbus clouds, and then you grow up and realize taxes suck and you're never going to become a cloud, so you decide to live in a cave and be a hunter-gatherer. Except you got no skills in that, so you get a job and play pretend when you get home. She's oblivious to me, which is probably a good thing, because if she tries to talk to me, who knows if my head is going to spin around or I'm going to vomit on her or something. I hurry inside, upstairs, and into my bedroom, slamming the door behind me. Oh my god, I punched Jamal. I punched Jamal. I punched my friend Jamal right in the face, with my fist hand, my hand fist. I punched Jamal in the face with my fist. He's probably thinking I finally snapped. I doubt he's crying because I got really soft hands and they're a little small, which is why my dad always said I was better off playing a little instrument like a tin whistle and not trying to play the trombone or the piano. But still, I kind of sucker punched him. I hope I didn't hurt him. I need to go back. What? Why? Furfur asks. He's hiding in the back of my brain. For a while, he was in control. That's when he turned Mrs. Donovan into a dog and let her eat Mrs. Clark before slicing off David's fingers. But then when we ran into Jamal, he scurried into the back of my head and I can feel him back there like a second voice in my brain that occasionally makes the inside of my skull hurt. I need to apologize to Jamal, I say. I think about it for a second. And David. Maybe not David. I mean, he's kind of nuts. He lost both his parents, too. And that can make you nuts. I know how that is. Boy, do I. Yeah, I'm sure that will go smoothly. Furfur sounds sarcastic. Let's just run all the way across town and say we're sorry to two people who probably aren't even there anymore. Oh, and I'll glue David's fingers back on while we're at it. You can do that? Ugh. Lassie, I turned an old lady into an invasive fungal species and then a dog. I twist people's souls into animal, vegetable, and mineral. Yeah, I can put the fingers back on a child. Somebody just has to wish it so. When he says it like that, it does sound like a dumb question. Normally it wouldn't be, though. He notices me considering it. But we're not doing that. We're here. We just need the totem, and we can... We interrupt this argument to announce that there's this weird screeching static suddenly in my head. It sounds like when Roger used to try to make heavy metal music with his friend Skeeter and Dustin in the garage, only he couldn't think of any words, so he just screamed into the microphone. My parents hated that, but they didn't want to stifle his creativity. Meanwhile, I paint a rat skull into one of my still lives, and suddenly there's limits. Through the static, I hear one word. Don't. As quickly as it started, the noise in my brain stops. I realize I'm clutching my ears hard enough I could yank them off. I wonder if anyone's ever done that. It shouldn't be too hard to rip your own ears off if you've got the will to do it. They aren't exactly firmly attached to the side of your head. I'm not going to try it, though. It's just a thought. We all have thoughts like that, don't we? Don't we? So just grab it! Furfur snaps from the dark side of my mind. What was that? I ask, rubbing my ears. Are you serious? You didn't hear anything I just said? No, I mean the static. The screeching? Uh, don't worry about that. Just grab the doll. We need to break the veil. You mean break into the veil? Outside, a car door slams. I wonder if that's Jamal's dad come to talk to Mrs. Lake about me punching his son. Jamal's dad doesn't like me. Jamal's told me some of the things he said at the dinner table, like how my parents didn't discipline me enough, or my mom might have had relations with Satan, or my father is an alcoholic who bangs on drums all day instead of raising his kids. Oh, and my favorite one, that Lily's the type of girl to get doused in pig blood at prom and burn the entire school down. I have so many questions about that last one, like what is prom and why do they hose people down with piggy blood at it? I can't imagine what he'd say if he ever met Meredith. Yes, whatever, break into the veil, just get the totem. Furfur sounds frantic. Frantic Furfur. That's like the name of a cartoon squirrel or something. Hold your horses, I tell him. I'm not sure where that saying comes from. Probably the Old West. They did lots of things with horses back then. Hold your horses basically means to calm down. I guess horses used to get really riled up and crazy and people had to hold them and calm them down. Dogs get kind of crazy and riled up too, but nobody ever says hold your dogs. 
I point to the closet. Pasher's in there, and don't worry, he doesn't seem to be at his uh, post on the other side. It still works though, right? I feel for her take control of my legs and start forcing me to walk toward the closet. He takes control of my right hand and opens the door. I look up at the top shelf of the closet where I had set Pasher this morning before I went downstairs to eat eggy waffles. Trust me, it still works, I tell him. He steps into the closet with my legs and reaches up with my right hand to grab Pasher. The moment I feel the soft felt of Pasher's clothes in my fingers, I jerk my left arm out from behind me and tip myself over. I end up tumbling out of the closet, falling backwards against the bed. There's a sick sensation in my tummy like I'm going to upchuck and I hear nothing but an angry roar inside my head as Furfur gets torn out of it. I set up quickly to avoid barfing upward. I knew a girl in school named Henny who got sick once in the middle of class and I remember how she tilted her head back aiming her mouth upward and the nasty yellow barf sprayed out of her like the world's most disgusting fountain. Everyone around her tried to throw themselves out of their seats to avoid getting splashed by it. They didn't have to worry though because most of it came right back down in her face. Two other kids threw up just watching it. That was not a fun day to be the janitor, I think. I'm lying on the floor, but still inside the closet is Furfur. He looks like a dark, swirling, cumulonimbus cloud filled with eyes. They're spinning around like they're going down the drain, but after a moment, the swirling eases up and they all turn toward me. They don't have eyebrows or foreheads, but there's a distinct sense that they're glaring angrily at me. What is this? He yells. His voice would probably be pretty intimidating if he were an adult-sized cloud, but he's more like a large cat-sized cloud. I stand up and brush myself off. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I smile at the swirly vortex of eyeballs. I've been doing months of research on demons. I point to the construction paper I had spent days taping together, drawing on with highlighters and then laid on the floor of the closet. That's called a magic triangle. I know what it's called! Furfur snarls. We had a deal, you little... He calls me some really not nice words, including some I've never heard before. I assume they're not nice words, too. That's not very nice, I tell him. That just makes him angrier, and he says them louder. Little lightning bolts flare up inside him like he's trying to electrocute me, but they stick to the inside of the magic triangle like one of those plasma balls they have at the science museum where you can touch it and all your hair stands up. I go across the room and set Pasher down on the dresser. He remains quiet. I still don't know if he's watching or busy somewhere else. I have to admit, that part worries me a little. Inside my head, it's just static still. Afterward, I grab one of the chairs from my art table and drag it back to the closet and sit down in front of Furfur, who is still storming. His little dark cloud body is making little drizzle rains on the construction paper, but it's not causing the highlighter to smudge, so that's okay. I knew I was going to meet a demon today, I tell him. I thought I had summoned, uh, what was his name? Boone, I think? Or maybe it's pronounced Booney? But then David Clark told me he had a stuffed rabbit named Furfur, and I recognized the name immediately. Bullshit. I admit I was disappointed because you can't really bring my parents back at all, can you? No. He hisses slowly. I get the sense that telling the truth is actually painful to him. That's what the magic triangle is for. It does two things, contains demons and forces them to tell the truth. Well, at least that's what this one does. There's lots of magic triangles. Even math has magic triangles, though they just make people fall asleep or not want to go to school. Have you ever had a Hertz donut? I ask the swirly cloud. Its eyes flash with another angry bolt of lightning. I don't know what those are. I smile. Roger would be so proud of me. What really was your plan? I ask sweetly. Furfur struggles against the pain the magic triangle causes when he tries to resist answering my question. I was going to, damn you, tear a hole in the veil. <gasps> he gasps with relief whenever whatever it is the magic triangle causes him to feel finally stops. I lean in close to his nearest eye, so we're inches apart. Like in one of those prison movies when they got the two people on opposite sides of the glass and talking to each other over phones. Hurts, doesn't it? I grin. Yes! He screams. Being this close makes the scar on my face tingle. I think about reaching out to touch the glass like on the plasma balls and see if it would unfrizz my hair, but there is no glass and putting any part of me inside the triangle right now would be a bad idea. 
Furfur starts up another fit of angry words. I let him vent for a bit before deciding to continue. You told me you wanted to get into the veil before, so I know that's a lie. But you have to tell me the truth now when I ask, so that means you do want to tear a hole in it. But not for the reason you claimed before. I drum my fingers on my chin. So why do you want to tear a hole in it? Furfur lights up like a Christmas tree, which I find amusing since demons probably don't celebrate Christmas. That'd be like British people celebrating the 4th of July. Somewhere in the dark, cloudy mess of eyeballs, I see a mouthful of sharp teeth and he's grinding them down right in front of me. The plan is, is to tear, ah, to tear, to tear a hole, ah, tear a hole in the pit, damn you! He actually screams a lot more than that, but I'm not going to write it all down because it's hard to figure out what letters correspond to some of the sounds he makes. Just imagine injured animal type screams, like a fox getting eaten by a starving pack of coyotes. My skin feels cold suddenly, giving me goosebumps like when I leave a window open. I turn to look and make sure I didn't actually just do that. Well, nope, window's closed. Gotta focus. Furfur finally chuckles behind me. <laughs> For a prepubescent, you've made some pretty powerful enemies. I know, it's kind of ridiculous. I don't even know what prepubescent is. It's probably just another insult. But he's right. Lisa Welch, Weaselface, Felix, what's his name, David Clark, Samuel, this demon now. I shouldn't have to keep track of people who want to hurt me. I should be riding a bicycle and swinging on swings and painting still lifes, not watching dogs tear people apart and battling monsters with hands for heads and all that crazy stuff I've had to do. It really gets to me sometimes. Downstairs, something crashes. It's loud and startling. I wonder if Mrs. Lake came in while I was busy thinking about Christmas trees and dropping something heavy like a refrigerator or a television set. It reminds me that there's probably people looking for me right now because of some kid with missing fingers and a lady who got eaten by a dog. And Jamal getting punched, of course. That's the worst one. Hecate sends her regards. Furfur whispers. Hecate, the witch queen of the veil. I guess that's ex-witch queen. Or rather, witch ex-queen? Maybe she's both. An ex-witch ex-queen. One of Samuel's servants. I don't know what happened to him, but I know what happened to her. There was an angel abandoned or something like that, and he sent her to the pit. But not before she tortured me by making me think my mom was dead before she actually was dead so I had to go through her being dead twice. Although the first time wasn't my fault. And then Hecate made me fight Lisa Welch in a knife fight, which left me with a scar on my face that itches sometimes, but I'm not supposed to scratch at it. You're doing that thing, aren't you? Where you're all lost in your thoughts and trying to sort them and decide what to do? I know exactly what's going on in that little head of yours. Thank you for giving me an up close and personal look inside. What an empty shell you have there on your shoulders. I turn back to him. So Hecate sent you? He grunts and then starts to rumble inside his magic triangle prison. N no, Ugh! no, fine. It wasn't she who sent me. Although she is the catalyst for what brought me here. What does that mean? Why is Hecate on a list of cats? He starts to say something, but I get distracted by the sound of heavy footsteps thumping up the stairs. There's lots of metal jangle sounds like someone wrapped in chains at a dance party. My brother Roger's friend Skeeter likes to wear lots of chains. He always sounded like a knight in chainmail whenever he came over to play music in the garage. There's also a sound of some sort of chatter cutting in and out. I recognize it from the day spent sitting around the police department with Detective Guthrie. It's a police radio. The knob on my bedroom door rattles. Whoever just came upstairs is trying to get in. They pound at it with their fist. The door, not the knob. Pounding on a doorknob doesn't accomplish anything but causing bruises. Lillian? Comes a female voice. Open up! She pounds on the door again. Time's up. Furfur says with one of those very pleased with himself tones like Lisa Welch always has. I hate that tone. At least coming from other people. It's fine when I do it. My dad always said that that kind of thinking was hypocritical, but when I went and looked at that word, it's actually some promise doctors make to never hurt their patients, so I don't think my dad knew what he was talking about. I hurry over to my dresser where all my clothes are. 
I put my clothes in the drawers based on what level of my body they go on. The second top drawer is all my shirts, and then comes undershirts for under my shirts and undies for underpants and then pants. The top drawer just has a hat in it. I don't like wearing hats, but Mrs. Lake gave me this one with a wide brim to keep the sun out of my eyes in the summer. I had to completely reorganize my dresser when she gave it to me because suddenly my shirts weren't my top most clothing item. I open the bottom drawer where my socks are. I've got this one sock in a ball that's actually a sock within a sock within a sock within a sock. One, two, three, uh, within two more socks. Six socks. I was going to do five socks, but six socks sounds better. Within the six sock is an egg. I stashed it inside the socks weeks ago so it wouldn't break that easily. I spent days figuring out the right symbols and drew on it with these little felt-tipped markers. The tips were little, not the markers. I run back over with the egg to my closet while another round of pounding comes from the bedroom door. The woman pounding at the door must hear me moving. Lillian, it's Officer Jenkins. Do you remember me? I do remember her. Officer Jenny Jenkins. She's a Doberman that she watches action movies with. You should go before something bad happens to you, I shout to her. Lillian? The door bangs loudly like she's throwing her whole body against it. Open the door and we can talk about things. Nobody wants to hurt you. Well, that's not true, I mutter as I approach the demon trapped in my closet who very much wants to hurt me. I hold the egg up to him. Do you know what this is? I ask Furfur. It's an egg, he says. The question doesn't seem to be significant enough for him to struggle against answering me truthfully. I turn the egg around so he can see what I've drawn on it. No, no. Do you know what this is? I ask again, showing him the markings. That's, uh... He squints at the containment spell I've drawn on the egg shell, which is a difficult thing to do when you're nothing but a cloudy mess with a bunch of eyes floating in it. Oh, damn you, you little... Before the demon who came out of a stuffed rabbit can finish its bad word-filled sentence, I stick my hand with the egg inside the magic triangle, which is something I never thought I'd say. Furfur howls in rage. He bites my wrist with his mouth full of sharp teeth, but he can't get a grip on me because the egg is sucking him in like a vacuum cleaner sucks up dust bunnies. Those aren't real animals, by the way. It's just something people call little balls of dust. I guess because they want to make dust seem cute? But dust is really made out of little bits of dried skin and pollen from plants and dirt and little tiny microscopic bugs, which is not cute at all. I don't know why people want to make dust seem cute. Maybe so that they can trick kids into cleaning it up? Within seconds, the closet appears empty. I pull my hand back to look at the bite marks on my wrist. It burns like when a cat scratches you and then you wash it with soap. <sighs> the marks are red and raised. I also look at the egg. It's turned a nasty brown color and smells slightly like eggs, really. Not a nice smell. I can't believe the babies come from these things. Get away from the door! Officer Jenny shouts from the hallway. I know what that means. I quickly stuff the egg, quickly but carefully, because I don't want it to break into the pocket of one of my hoodies hanging on a hanger. And then I push the hoodie to the back of the closet, crouch down in the center of the space, right over my highlighter magic triangle, and shut the closet door. At the same time, Officer Jenny comes in like gangbusters, kicking the door in so hard it slams against the wall and comes off one hinge. I watch her storm into the room through the slats in the closet door. She looks determined, which can easily be mistaken for angry unless you know the difference. It's little details, like just how much their forehead is wrinkled up in a scowl and whether or not they're gritting their teeth. She isn't doing either of those things. She just looks professional. I kind of admire her for that. Sometimes I think I want to be a police person when I grow up. But then I remember that the last police lady I met got burned into a charmello by my best friend. Where is Meredith anyway? The closet door flies open. Officer Jenny stares down at me with a determined look. Are you hurt? She asks me. Well, let's see. I got shoved on the sidewalk so my palms and knees were all scraped up. A lady hit me over the head with something hard. I probably have a concussion. And I got bit on the wrist by... Uh, p a platypus. Oh, no, I should have picked a different animal. Officer Jenny frowns. A platypus, huh? Let me see your wrist. I hold up my wrist for her to see the bite. She grabs it and slaps a handcuff on me. Lillian Madwip, you're coming with me. I am? You have the right to remain silent. 
oh my God, she's romantizing me. I'm going to go to the police station in the back of a police car. They're going to throw me in jail. I'm only 11 years old. My picture's going to be in all the newspapers. 11-year-old sent away for life. I'm going to be like that Lizzie Borden girl who killed her parents. I think they dropped a rock on her or something. Officer Jenny finishes talking. Do you understand these rights as they have been read to you? No, I admit. Well, let's go. She puts her hand under my armpit and tries to lead me out of the room. Can I just apologize to Jamal? I ask. I didn't mean to hit him. I was being chased by a crazy boy who had kidnapped me and tried to kill me. I started to cry a little, not because I'm scared. I mean, I am scared of going to jail and having to fight people in the showers and have babies behind bars. But more because crying is a good way to get grown-ups to be nicer to you. She kneels down so we're looking at each other eye to eye. For a moment, one of her eyes looks red and bloodshot, but I blink and it's gone. Just two blue eyes. Not sad fire ones like David Clark has, but there's something nice in her eyes. Look, I don't know what happened to you today, but you can tell us your side of things at the station, all right? Andrew is there. Detective Guthrie. I don't know who Jamal is, but there's a boy in the hospital and he said you're the one who put him there. See what I said about crying? It totally works. She pushes the button on her shoulder radio. I've got the Mad Whip girl. I'm bringing her in. Roger. Someone on the other end says. Roger's my brother's name, I tell Officer Jenny. She gives another fake smile. Oh yeah? Where is he? He's dead, I say with a sigh. He got turned into mashed potatoes by a truck a couple years ago. And now he's in the veil, probably watching me get arrested on a movie screen and laughing his butt off. She blinks and her smile fades. Okay, then. We walk downstairs together and outside where Mrs. Lake is being held back by our neighbor, Mr. Malachevsky. His name isn't actually Malachevsky, but that's as close as I can get to spelling it right. It's Polish, and they seem to like to swap out the vowels in their names for other letters. It's pronounced Melachowski, but I think it's spelled with a Z, and I think there's a W in there, but they're both silent. They got remandized too, I guess. Lily! Mrs. Light calls, trying desperately to get free of Mr. N. We'll, we'll be right behind you, sweetie. Don't be scared. It's going to be all right. It's okay to cry. And then she demonstrates for good measure by bursting into tears and rubbing her face on Mr. M's clean shirt. I'm well ahead of you, Mrs. Lake. Officer Jenny helps me climb in the back of her police car. It kind of smells like a public toilet back there. There's a stain on the seat that I hope is from vomit. I look through the glass shield that separates the front and back of the car. Officer Jenny's got a shotgun. I can't believe she didn't bring it inside with her when she came for me. I guess they don't consider me that much of a threat. We pull away as Mrs. Lake finally squeezes out of Mr. M's grip and runs after us briefly before turning around and hurrying inside the house, probably to call Mr. Lake, or a lawyer, or both. This is all going to be very hard to explain. I hope David Clark doesn't die from blood loss. He can back up some of what I'm going to have to tell them. I sit back and start trying to work out what parts to be honest about and what parts to fib about because they'll never believe me anyway. I just gotta remember to not mention... Platypuses. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, if you could do me a quick little favor, hit that little <sighs> thumbs up since there's no longer a thumbs down and go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit the bell because we're required to say that now by law. If you guys are listening on the podcast, then I don't exactly know how those work. But I think there's a follow button or a subscribe button or something like that to hit. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my contributors on Patreon. You guys are the real MVP. You guys keep the lights on here. And allow me to do a whole bunch of cool things like exclusive stories that we're getting a lot more of now, honestly. So thank you guys so much for being a part of that. And as a very special thank you to all of the big skeleton patrons, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ars, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Mask Note, Rashad Collins, Joshua Mullen, Zavium, Dan Pham, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Ben Spates, Anna Storm, Jeremy H, Raltazol, Nana, The Morgan, Diamondella, Melted Lake, Tully Sue, William King, Reaper61167, 
Darth Myver, Micah Ortiz, Satanic Aries, I Soda Hatred, Nessie, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Miss Alexandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Michael Scarborough, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for being a part of Patreon, and for everybody who's down there in the description, and everybody who even contributes just one dollar to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And, as always, my friends, sweet dreams. <laughs>